Please be seated. Welcome to the founding conference of the Reformed Baptist Network. How good it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. What a culmination of prayers and planning this all is. Uh, my name is Pastor Nick Alford, and on behalf of Grace Baptist Church of Taylor, South Carolina, welcome to every one of you. My co-pastor, Jamie Howell, who's actually the conference coordinator, will be giving a more formal introduction and some announcements later. But as we're starting out our morning, we're going to start with a devotion from God's Word. And our speaker for that devotion is Pastor John Heaney. Uh, one of the neat things about this conference and what the Lord is doing is that we all don't know each other necessarily. And so let me share a little bit about who Pastor Heaney is if you don't know him. John Heaney grew up in a Christian home in Bremen, Indiana, where under God's gracious hand he came to faith in Christ. He is a graduate of Grace College in Winona Lake, where he received BA degrees in Biblical Studies and in General Business. John has been one of the pastors of Grace Fellowship Church since its inception in 1983. Brother, would you please come and give this morning's devotion. Thank you, Nick, and good morning, brothers and sisters. It is good to be together, and especially so because of what we're coming together to do this week, to join arms in the greatest cause on earth, to further the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ in the salvation of sinners and in the building of his church. And what is our privilege to be working together in this and working together with him to be fishing with our Lord Jesus, to be sowing with him, planting with him, watering and reaping with him. And may he meet us in these days and be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that his ways may be known on earth, his salvation among all nations. I was asked to bring a devotional that would challenge our hearts for missions. And my proposition is simply this, that a heart for missions is maintained by a heart for the king whose mission it is. Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well by the gate of Bethlehem. Those words are found in my text in 2 Samuel 23, 13 to 17, where we find David after his anointing, but before his coronation as king, still running for his life uh, from King Saul and his army. And here he is, 2 Samuel 23, hiding out in the cave of Adullam. Uh, I wonder if you've done any hiding lately. Maybe playing hide-and-seek with your children or your grandchildren. Uh, if so, uh, you know that once you find a good hiding spot, there's a whole lot of doing nothing. Uh, you can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. You just need to keep a low profile. And here's David hiding. Not until they count to 30, but, but for days and weeks and perhaps months on end without leaving once he's found a good hiding place. And that's a lot of time just to sit and think and to remember. And we're told that he's thirsty. He, he longed for water. And his thirst takes him back to his hometown in Bethlehem. And how well he remembers caring for his sheep in the heat of the day, uh, coming home parched and then stopping at that well by the gate of Bethlehem and just drinking and drinking till he could drink no more. There was no water like it, the, the cool, fresh well water of, of Bethlehem. He could almost taste it even now and is saying, oh, to have a drink of that water right here in the cave of Adullam. Now, it was not a command. It was hardly even a request. It was more like a daydreaming man uh, thinking aloud, a whispered wish but that was all that was needed for three of David's mighty men. For to them, his wish was their command. 
And so they were off to fetch the water some 12 miles away. They fought their way through the lines of the Philistines who were encamped there. They drew water from the well by the gate of Bethlehem. They fought their way back through to David and then presented that precious water to David. And when he realized what they had done, he was both humbled and horrified, uh, which really shows us that he never intended for his wish to be carried out at all. And so he refused to drink the water that they had risked their lives their life's blood to fetch. Far be it from me, O Lord, to do this, he said. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives? And so, though he had the highest regard for his men, he nevertheless poured it out in worship to the Lord. And the scene closes with this summary, verse 17. Such were the exploits of the three mighty men. Now, to be sure, these exploits reveal much to us about these mighty men of David. Uh, we see something of their strength and their prowess, their, their courage, their commitment, their selfless sacrifice. But doesn't this tell us as much about David as it tells us about them? Yes, they risked their lives, but it was for David that they risked them. What must David have been to them? that they would not count their own lives dear to themselves, charging into the very jaws of death, if only his cause might be furthered. Indeed, if only his wish might be satisfied. They, they clearly saw something in David that had won their hearts, and that's what motivated them to venture their lives just to bring him pleasure. It was their captain himself who inspired such exploits for him. And is it any different, brothers and sisters, in the cause that has brought us together this week? Has not David's greater son won the hearts of his servants such that we no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for us and was raised again? Have we not found in our great captain, Jesus Christ, that which motivates us to lay down our lives in service to him and to his great unfinished business, which is so dear to his heart? And so a heart for missions is gained and maintained by a heart for the king whose mission it is. So how has our king captured our hearts? Well, is it, is it not by his person and his work? Is it not just that he who was in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very form of a servant and being made in the likeness of a man? And why? For love. For love. Yes, love for his heavenly Father who sent him, but love for us who needed him. Love caused thine incarnation. Love brought thee down to me. Thy thirst for my salvation procured my liberty. Gerhardt writes, Our mighty captain left the deserved comforts and glories of heaven out of thirst for our salvation. It was love that brought him down on this saving mission that had his heart from all eternity to save us from eternal torments to make us his children, God's children forever. It was eternal love that broke through in the incarnation. And it was his love in the, the many temptations that he suffered for us. In the wilderness, we learn of our Savior that he'd rather starve than, or he'd rather die. He'd rather starve and die than to sin. And it was for us that he is there in the wilderness refusing to satisfy his own desires. For their sakes I satisfy or I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified. Over and over in every temptation he's denying himself for us out of love for us that he might have a perfect righteousness to give to us who had none to commend ourselves to God. It was his love that 
for which he became man, for which he became tempted. It was love for which he went into Gethsemane and prayed, not my will, but thine for us. And it was supremely his love at the cross that has won our hearts forever. For it was there that he not only broke through the lines of the enemy, but he conquered sin and Satan, death and hell for us. Now David's men risked their lives for him, but our captain laid down his life for us. They did it to get David a drink of Bethlehem's water. Jesus did it to get us a drink of living water, which if a man drink, he will never thirst again. And so our Savior on Calvary drank the cup of God's wrath that we would have been drinking forever, that we might with joy draw water from the wells of salvation. And again, our Lord was made to thirst, or we would have been thirsty forever with not a drop to cool our tongues in the agony. Cecil Alexander writes, His, his are the thousand sparkling rills that from a thousand fountains burst and fill with music all the hills. And yet he saith, I thirst. But more than pains that racked him then was the deep longing thirst divine that thirsted for the souls of men, dear Lord, and one was mine. So it's our captain's exploits of love for us that have captivated our hearts. No wonder he has men in his service who would say, your wish is my command. Such love constrains us to answer his call. Follow his leading and give him our all. So a heart for missions is maintained by a heart for the king whose mission it is. Now if David's men were willing to risk their lives for him, then surely our captain is worthy of no less from us, his blood-bought servants. Consider, they did it to satisfy a physical thirst of David. We do it to satisfy a deeper thirst of our Lord Jesus, a thirst for the souls of men that are precious in his sight. They ventured their lives to fulfill a mere wish of David. And we have so much more than a wish, don't we, brethren? Our king has given us a royal command, and that command, to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them and teaching them all that our Savior has commanded. David's men flew into action to satisfy his wish. We must do no less to satisfy his command. But it's more than a command, isn't it? This command of our Savior is no no mere arbitrary command. It's rather a revelation of himself to us. His commands are windows into his heart that reveal his own deep thirsts and desires. And in this last command, his great command, our king has opened wide his heart to us, revealing his thirst for his worldwide bride to be gathered to himself. I wonder if you can detect it. He's telling us of his thirst for souls, of his great love, his desire to save sinners. Is that not what lies behind this great command, the great commission? His pleasure and seeing sinners turn and live. And is his pleasure not worth doing exploits to fulfill? David's men went without a promise of success. Isn't that something? They were willing to risk it all just in the attempt. We do it with the best and the surest of promises. He has said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now you go and I will be with you to the very end of the age. What a promise of the presence and power of the Lord Jesus with us as we go. And does that not secure the ultimate success? That the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And so the promised success of our mission means it's a cause worth living and dying for. Oh, but there are difficulties to be faced in this mission. But I'd remind you that getting a drink of water from Bethlehem's well had its difficulties too. There was the 
the danger of losing life to satisfy David's wish, the danger of death. But they deemed that the pleasure of their king was worth it. There are other fears to be overcome. There's the fear of failure. What if our church planting work doesn't succeed? What if our missionary endeavor doesn't work out? Fears of not only being counted fools by the world, but being counted failures by our fellow churches. Fears that could paralyze us and effectively sideline us from venturing by faith right into the raging battlefield. I've appreciated much Ian Murray's biography of J.C. Ryle that I just finished. And Ryle speaks of men who were overly cautious. Play it safers. Men eaten up with caution who, in his words, seem so afraid of doing wrong that they hardly do right. And I find that I need love's compelling power to overcome my play-it-safe self. Yes, there are dangers. Yes, there are, there's fears to be faced to satisfy our Savior. There's the love of ease that would allure us to carve out a comfortable ministry that requires little of us in the way of, of anything of radical faith, of the cross, of self-sacrifice, and this can be a special temptation to some of us who are coming closer to the ends of our race, and we begin to consult our creature comforts and an easy retirement and think of coasting in our final years. J.C. Ryle's successor at Liverpool wrote of Ryle, he began his work as bishop at an age when most men are beginning to think of rest. He was 63. And he labored on without hasting and without resting so long as his brain could think and his hand could write. We have some modern-day examples among us that are encouragements to us of the same. To finish well. Our boys were swimmers. And we learned in the sport of swimming that races can be literally won or lost at the wall. And so a man could, could swim a good race and yet lose it at the wall. He could swim a good race and win it at the wall. And older brothers, let's hit the wall all out. Let's finish well. There'll be time enough in heaven to rest, but now to the work, for the night is coming when no man can work. So whatever your age, rise up, O men of God. Have done with lesser things. Oh, the lesser things that too often replace the grand thing. Give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of kings. So we're making a new beginning this week. A new beginning at networking for the fulfillment of this grand command. And it's my own felt need that a new commitment to gospel mission requires a new commitment to our gracious King, whose mission it is. Is it not something we can learn from these three mighty men of David, that as the King has the hearts of his servants, his mission will have all that they are laid at his disposal, offered in his service. I think the observation of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones serves as a needed caution to us at this constituting conference. He said that every institution tends to produce its opposite. Well, that can be scary because here we are. We're all excited about coming together on this great work of fulfilling our Savior's last command. But due to the remaining down drag of sin, Lloyd-Jones is reminding us that we can end up far from where we're beginning this week. And I believe that no constitution or policy manual or mission statement, all as important as they are, can keep us true to the mission. Well, then what, if not that? Is it not just keeping our hearts close to Jesus, whose mission it is, close to Him, that will keep us committed to the fulfilling of His mission, the very desire of his heart. And one of the scariest things is, is that we can drift away from the king even as we are busy doing his work. 
Martin Lloyd, or it was Robert Murray McShane that said, there's no labor in the king's service that will make up for neglect of the king himself. No labor in the king's service that will make up for the neglect of the king himself. And that's the thing that's critical, I believe, to us sticking to the mission. It's near his heart that we catch and keep his burden, that we feel his thirst for souls, and that we long to have it quenched. It's walking with him in the Gospels and seeing him fish for men. Seeing him seek and save that which was lost. Whether he's preaching to the crowds, this very sight of which moved his heart with compassion because he saw them as helpless and harassed sheep without a shepherd. Or he saw them as a valuable harvest rotting in the field for lack of workers living with Christ in the Gospels when he's speaking to individuals and his thirst is no less evident when meeting with Nicodemus by night or with the Samaritan woman at noon and telling her where living water is to be found. It's hearing him sobbing over, uh, over unrepentant Jerusalem and it's seeing him rejoicing with great celebration over one sinner that repents. It's hearing us tell of his great pleasure and just one sinner turning and living in these ways and more. We can't miss his deep thirst for soul as we stay near him and walk with him in the scripture. It's in near communion with him that our hearts then beat in sync with his. And when he has our hearts, brethren, he will have our labors. That is for sure. And then nothing will be too costly to see his thirst satisfied so let all of our work for him be done in moment-by-moment moment fellowship with him. And then we'll not be moved from his mission. We'll not become the opposite of what we're beginning this week. We'll find our joy in life to bring sinners to this Savior. And we'll labor shoulder to shoulder, rejoicing in each other's victories and in the pleasure of our King. So I guess what I'm suggesting in this devotional is that we match our new commitment to the Great Commission this week with a new commitment to the King himself. To me, it's one of the most glorious things of the Christian life that we get to start over. We get to begin over again and again. I find every morning my Savior meets me with mercy, compassion, grace upon grace. We get to start afresh we're starting a work for gospel mission afresh. Let's start afresh in our commitment to the king. After 20 years of preaching the gospel on both sides of the Atlantic, that great missionary evangelist George Whitfield could write, I want to begin to do something for Jesus. And 10 years later, he's still praying, Lord, help me to begin, to begin. I don't know about you, but before I meet my Savior face to face, I want to begin to do something new for Jesus. I trust that's your heart. That's what's brought you here. And as we link hearts and hands together in this new beginning to glorify God through fellowship and cooperation and fulfilling the Great Commission to the ends of the earth, let's begin by giving ourselves up afresh to our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, presenting our bodies as living sacrifices to do His will. Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well by the gate of Bethlehem. Can you hear it from our Savior? Oh, that someone would fetch me glory from the nations by bringing sinners to me. Oh, that new churches would be planted new disciples made. Oh, that someone would pray, Lord, make me a fisher of men like you. Oh, that someone would pray, send out new workers into the harvest field. Oh, that someone would ask me to do those greater works so that the Son might bring glory to the Father. This deep thirst in our Savior means nothing to the, to the world, but by grace it has a powerful pull on the hearts of the King's men then let us who know our King be strong and together do exploits to the praise of His glorious grace. Amen.